Hello and welcome to lesson number 10. Uh, we are almost arriving at the end of our uh, cycle of cycle of lessons. We will have two more uh, lessons. So now lesson number 10 and then lesson number 11 and then lesson number 12 will be the sum up uh, of all the topics we have been uh, discussing here in the pre previous lessons. And I will also give you some book recommendations which you can use if you are interested to give you a scope, a wider scope on the topic of uh, architecture, history and theory with a focus on embodiment, which is the focus that this course uh, has had. So on lesson number 10, we will discuss how the baby boom generation recovered from Second World War with the exponential growth of cities mass construction and a progressive dependency on technology and natural resources. It will describe how bodies became a commodity, pacified. Increased mediatization of culture and life through television, film, computer and internet occurs. Man lands on the moon. The body beats gravity through the aid of technology. The body becomes a cyborg. First successful cloning of organs and animals is achieved. Embodied architecture evolves from the labor camp to the suburban house. The human body has become a field of intense reflection with the turn of the millennium and the mystification of the role of digital technology in the future. The prophecy announced by Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke in the film 2001 A Space Odyssey that humans would be at the verge of a new evolutionary step while conquering space travel through the use of artificial intelligence didn't take shape exactly as they stated, as it still isn't available as a common means of transportation due to the extreme cost of the technology and also to travel risks. Anyhow, cyberspace gave another the body to Kubrick's idea, as today anyone can space travel without moving just by using software and connecting through the web to one of the satell many satellites around the Earth. As Neil Spiller has stated, in cyberspace, all modernist rules are defeated, gravity, enclosed space, circulation, and many other things lose significance. Um, so we start with this, with this reference of, of the film 2001 Space Odyssey uh, from uh, Arthur C. Clarke and, and uh, from Stanley Kubrick based on the story of uh, Arthur C. Clarke. And we start this as a kind of a reference or or a metaphor of how in the 60s space travel really uh, opened, uh, opened these uh, possibilities uh, of, uh, of uh, exploring, um, exploring through space travel, but also exploring uh, the limits uh, of the human body, what the human body could do, uh, and also how to design for such uh, conditions, how to design for the condition of zero gravity, for example. And this had a very large uh, effect and also very uh, important scientific uh, developments uh, that could understand how to um, create uh, an artificial environment that could uh, support human life outside of uh, planet Earth. Nowadays, we I'm always putting this into, into the context now of, of the present. Um, and of course space travel is a very interesting and exciting topic and I personally love science fiction and love this idea of, of space travel uh, but nowadays as designers most of all we have I think it's really important that we refocus our attention um, in the preservation of the planet where we actually live in uh, and not not only in this uh, over ambition exploration of, of other planets and, and other resources. So I just wanted to make this um, this parallel with, with nowadays, but in any case, the research and the developments which were done um, in, in the sense to, to make possible space travel and to construct uh, these uh, spaceships and these environments which supported uh, the human body and human life uh, out, out of space, which do support human life uh, out of space. Uh, this knowledge was also really important because it was applied in many situations, uh, for example, in medicine, but also uh, in, in our 
environment or in urban environments here on planet Earth. For example, the effects, the psychophysiological effects of color in light in architecture and especially in interior design. Um, there were very, uh, there was a lot of development due to the research which was done for uh, space travel. And this knowledge also was applied uh, in the field of architecture and interior design uh, to make uh, environments here on, on planet Earth that better support uh, human, human living and the human uh, establishment. So it is important also to, to understand how with the specific goal of space travel we achieved that other, uh, other um, sources, sources of knowledge that uh, in fact can be used can be used here and have been used here and also that this kind of scientific uh, based uh, research form for design uh, that it has uh, it has had consequences uh, in the way in the way we we design and in the way we build uh, and this kind of knowledge has also developed uh, further uh, especially now with the influence like i mentioned in the videos before with the influences or with the influence of neurosciences and cognitive sciences and also ergonomics and neuroergonomics more and more we have knowledge available that uh, really allows us to make an to make an evaluation of the impact that the urban environment has in the human body as a full uh, uh, sensorial uh, system and so um, and, and this was also connected to, to what was done in the development of, of uh, space travel. So now we return to contemporary, not uh, space travel, but uh, the connection with, uh, with the technological development in the 21st century. So as an increasing number of people spend their time using the same tools they use for work, or leisure, namely the computer and the internet. As stated in the previous lesson, this leads us to think about the impact in terms of physical and mental health um, that this kind of interaction has on the human body uh, in the short and medium term. There is an increased use of virtual communication platforms beyond the essential email with the introduction of social networks, for example, like Facebook, where people can communicate with an indefinite number of users globally. The interaction in virtual spaces begins to gain, gain a large role in the social life of individuals, especially among teenagers, but also in professional terms, through the communication of enterprises and organizations, and even to uh, political campaigns. Uh, this is an important topic not to make another parallel because actually I have prepared, prepared this text and this lesson for you before the corona crisis so it was meant to give you also this kind of awareness of how the excessive use of digital tools might have a negative impact in the human body because in many ways they make us feel connected but uh, but they're also in some ways uh, alienated because we prefer more and more to be glued to our phones and to our computers and and uh, being less and less outside uh, interacting outside in the real world and now with the corona crisis even our <laughs> situation now our learning uh, and teaching situation was completely uh, disrupted and can only exist because we have this technology so uh, one really has to say and i personally also has to say have to say that um Although I think it's really important to to keep a balance between between the our digital selves and our real selves, uh, and and really understand that our, we have material bodies and our material bodies need um, need uh, expression and existence in in the real in the real world and not just the real virtual world. But actually, the boundaries between these two worlds are getting more and more diluted. And um, if it wouldn't be, in fact, for the technology at, at the moment, we, we would be, in fact, socially very, very disconnected due to this present situation we, had, we have. So although I did prepare this text for you before, now my own personal opinion due to this current situation is also, is also transformed and it's put uh, into context. 
but in any case i still make a make a point here uh, that it is really important that uh, that we as architects and interior designers that we understand the importance of building the importance of building and the importance of the built environment uh, to keep a sense of balance uh, and and to compensate for the successive presence of digital media in in our life I make this um, argument now because uh, many authors, for example, Yuhani Palazma, um, who I mentioned before, and he writes a lot about uh, in the context of architecture, history and theory, and he writes a lot about the body uh, in architecture and the experience, the sensuous experience of the body in architecture. Um, as architecture can be or interior space can be the expression of our existential space and our existential needs so Johanny Palazma talking about space and for example how it's represented in cinema which directly addresses this poetic existential dimension Palazma uh, and this is a quote that Citad says that the architecture designed by artists is a direct reflection of mental memories and dream images the artist creates an architecture of the mind art offers us alternative identities and situations of life and this is his great work to offer us the opportunity to experience our own existence through the existential experience of another so plasma here also wants to make a make an argument for how when we experience for example uh, a film when it's a really good film and and when the setting and the environment which is presented in the film has this kind of really strong um, emotional existential component that we can connect to the space and we can connect to the characters and somehow also develop develop ourselves and develop our our own sense of experience be, through this experience in this case of a film uh, but of course the same principle can be transported and Palasma writes exactly about this in the design of architectural space how by the design of architectural space we are creating uh, an environment or situations that allow us as humans to um, develop our sense of identity and, and to connect to our very personal experience of, of space and crea creation of a sense of place um and now we make another connection with with film and how film especially in the theories of of the 20th century how film has also influenced the way um architecture uh, architectural design uh, evolved and how for architecture we can actually learn in interior design we can learn a lot about film how film depicts architecture because film, in order to transmit the narrative and to not focus only on what's happening in the lives of the, char of the characters, and that's why interior uh, set design and production design is so important in film, um, film creates these uh, atmospheres, and it is through the atmosphere that the, the story is uh, presented and that the viewer while viewing the film can connect to the story and can connect to the to the characters and understand this experience the experience of the film as something real uh, and this happens because we have this capacity capacity for empathy you remember in the lessons before or i'm fooling i am so many times i've mentioned this capacity of empathy um, and this, of course, also has to do with some uh, disposition we have, uh, our uh, brain and, and what was uh, discovered uh, by neuroscientists, we, uh, the mirror neurons. So through the mirror neurons, we have this capacity of uh, seeing the experience of another person on screen or also when communicating and so. And through this process of empathy, 
put ourselves in that uh, situation. So this is what happens when we watch a film or when we watch a theater play. You remember in the last lesson when I addressed the psychological synchronism between uh, between the viewer of a theater play and, and the performer or the actor of the play, surrounded by the whole setting and the whole choreography. So this happens through this uh, process of uh, empathy. Um, and so now we will talk a little bit about how film, uh, especially how it's addressing the theories of the of the 20th uh, century and how film and the depiction of existential space uh, in film and the consequences this has in architecture. So regarding the affinity in terms of existential space between architecture and cinema, the author Walter Benjamin in his essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction states, that although the situation of watching a film transforms the viewer in a disembodied observer, the kinematic space of illusion returns to the spectator his body as the experience haptic, so or what we can feel with, with our body, and the moving space provide powerful synesthesia. So a movie is seen by both the eyes, we see a movie with the eyes, as well as the muscles and the skin. The images stored in our memory are both visual images and incorporated as haptic. So what Walter Benjamin, re Benjamin really wanted to say with this uh, citat was that when we are watching a film, and you can remember in one of the previous lessons when we, when we were talking about Baroque architecture, and I made this example, how does the body feel when we see this facade, this Baroque facade, that it feels like moves, and it kind of makes our body also move with this uh, facade. So when we when we watch a film, of course we have the story and the characters playing the story, but we also have the way the the film is cut and the camera angles and the way our eyes are being directed in the action. Uh, and of course we are not seeing a film only with our eyes; we are seeing it with our mind and we are seeing it with our whole body because the whole thing uh, works works together. So we are also having a haptic and haptic means related to touch. Uh, and so we are also having a haptic experience because our eyes are being stimulated by what we see and so we react. One example is, uh, for example, when, when watching a football, a football uh, match even someone who does not have much experience of playing football or not experience at all, depending on the level of interest, when watching the match and when following the action, sometimes something happens and we, we have an involuntary reaction or, or involuntary emotion as if we would be in the game. So we are, in many ways, we are experiencing the game through this process, through this process of empathy. So. We are experiencing this not just with the eyes, but also with our muscles and with the skin. Uh, and of course, this happens with the film, but this happens also in an interior space and in architecture. So we can make now a comparison also that regarding the experience we have of the worlds offered, for example, not just in film, but also in cyberspace or in virtual, uh, space, we can make the same conclusions that Palasma and uh, Benjamin take on the experience of theater as an immersive uh, medium. However, we can also ask ourselves about the impact that the excessive use of such me mechanisms of reality simulators might have in the physical, uh, physical and psychological terms when experienced by an individual and even in terms of society and, and um, society as a, as a whole. Um, so although, although it might, it is enriching that we can share experience also uh, through this medium, it's also important to think in how far this, can this deny uh, ourselves to be conscious of the experience of our own life. So um, Palasma also, points out in another publication called The Eyes of the Skin uh, that beyond architecture, contemporary culture, while forgetting our carnal and sensory dimension of existence, 
uh, might be heading towards a, a terrifying desensualization and desexualization of human relations with reality. Um, and this, this is an important point, and it's a point that um, I'm also experiencing this uh, corona uh, situation and this, um, and this uh, situation we have of, of uh, social uh, distancing. We, uh, we are connected virtually, we can communicate with other people uh, virtually, uh, but we are really now more and more aware of the importance of direct uh, human contact for, uh, and how important it is to walk outside and to talk to a person in, in person and to see the person and, and, and to touch and to have this kind of uh, physical, physical interaction, which is not possible when we are always mediating our interactions through virtual environments. So this topic was also addressed by another director, uh, David Cronenberg, who directed in 1999 the film Existence, reflecting precisely on the impact that the use of technology and particularly virtual reality and simulated reality computer games might have in the human body and, and the mind. Cronenberg uses an aesthetic which is itself rooted in the body horror genre, using sexual analogies to reinforce in a hyperbolic, exaggerated way the strange relationships that man is developing with te technology, uh, understanding it as part, uh, as part of the body. Of course, this is Cronenberg's own uh, position, um, but the fact is that we humans, we are, uh, we need uh, technology to to live because our human bodies just in the wild w would not survive in the wild without without uh, technology. But Cronenberg really explores not just in existence but in many of his films explores this uh, this need and this desire we have to extend and to protect and to communicate also through technology. But the fine line that exists. Uh, from the moment that technology is, stops helping us uh, and starts being being an ob obstacle to our own uh, humanity. So for some images uh, of uh, some stills of the film Existence, please take a look at figures 10.3 to 10.8. Um, and I forgot to mention before, in the context of Stanley Kubrick, so just to have an idea of this uh, setting uh, in, a, in a space station, uh, you can take a look at figures 10.1 and 10.2. Uh, so I will continue now to talk about uh, David Cronenberg and his films. Cronenberg presents a universe in which a sense of alienation and a growing dissatisfaction with the real world or the built environment leads to an increasing interest in experience, more and more centrally arousing experiences in virtual worlds. In the movie, such games, such a game, gaming experience is made by the direct connection of the gaming device to the nervous system. It is a fully immersive game, which is controlled by the user's brain wave frequencies, and the reality experienced by the characters is described in the film as more real than reality, where everything is much more erotic and where the appropriation of the world is made much more through the skin, touch and smell than by vision, expressing a lurking desire for sensuous and primal haptic experiences. Um, so I would really recommend that you watch this film, uh, Existence. Um, it, it can be a little bit disturbing uh, at some point, but it, it really makes some interesting uh, observations of how uh, humans really express uh, this need to to communicate to other bodies with with touch, uh, not just with sight, but but with feel. And this technology in the film, this technology of uh, existence, is something that is directly inserted uh, in the body. Uh, and um, and the gaming pods, they are made of flesh, so they they, they have this kind of appearance. They they really look uh, very organic, and it's something that it's directly inside the body and becomes a part of the body. 
um, but it, but it, then this other experience of being uh, of being in the virtual world becomes so much more interesting and so much more sensuous than what's happening in the real world um, that um, at some point the body loses interest uh, in, in being in the in the real world um, but it's I will not give spoilers to the film but in the end it's actually not so simple uh, who, the the boundaries between real and virtual get very confused at some point and so these worlds that the characters are going through they are also not as direct as as it seems so i definitely recommend that you that you watch watch this film because it's also for designers a very a very interesting uh, approach and actually this film existence and these whole ideas of of um, science fiction they also influenced a lot the developments of of uh, and experiments in architecture and especially in the field in the field of re of research uh, for many many authors and we we will address this now further further in this lesson um, many authors who were really interested in exploring this idea of uh, real what's real what virtual and how how we can integrate uh, integrate the new technologies in our life and in the design process uh, in and in architecture itself in the experience of architectural space and interior design uh, itself so with existence Cronenberg also alerts us to the fact that eventually this kind of experience might make, make us forget about our real body preferring a disembodied existence and leading to an increasing distortion of reality reaching the limit of not being able to distinguish between the real world and the game. In the film, the repression of the physical body for this more seductive virtual reality leads to phenomena of violence. So this is Cronenberg's um, Cronenberg's um, position on, on this topic. This is alluded to by the surprising ending of the film in which two main characters or players in the game condemn the creator of the game to death for a severe distortion of reality killing him with extreme violent, uh, violence, what Cronenberg proposes as an allegorical criticism of the violence induced by uh, video games. So this is Cronenberg's position about um, how, how video games and the experience in video games uh, in fact, in many ways, uh, shape our behavior and, um, and how technology in this way and this kind of interaction with technology shapes our behavior because in many ways it conditions how we act and how we think in certain, uh, in certain uh, situations. Um, I also have to make here a parallel that may, probably most of you know that the computer game industry, especially the simulator video games like shoot 'em ups and this this kind of of uh, game, but also driving uh, driving simulators and so on, they were for they were originally invented for uh, military to to train people for mili for war. Uh, for this kind of situations and, and now since many many years they are used also for leisure um, but but this of course has uh, has consequences in the in the way we we spend our free time and um, and and how uh, in many ways uh, it, it shapes our attitude also to violence in a way that violence becomes becomes something that is a uh, normal and that uh, and that is also fun so this is really a point that Cronenberg uh, makes and uh, makes uh, with this film um, and I think I think it's an it's a really um, important point because we as uh, architects and uh, interior designers we are designing our, our role in the world is to design for the well-being uh, of, of, of people and uh, often what happens is that we see a lot of designs you know of course and it's simplistic to say good architecture and bad uh, architecture but depending on the setting and on the situation there's a lot of uh, things we have in the built environment which are in terms of um, 
in terms of the senses and in terms of experience which are overstimulating and which are violent environments uh, in themselves with too strong uh, lights with the uh, use of uh, use of color and of course this has a lot to do with um, not just with the use of media but it also has a lot to do of course with with marketing and how for uh, specifically for certain commercial situations um, uh, color in, in publicity in advertisement especially uh, color is used in a way to seduce to seduce the consumer uh, to to bring attention and and um, and often to, cre to create uh, environments which which in terms of sensory stimulation are violent and, and have a really negative negative impact so although it does not seem possible to live in the reality described by david cronenberg in the film the technological potential exists and is already scientifically plausible um, so a philosopher called Gilles Deleuze about this uh, topic of of, um, of the of the virtual and the real world he proposed that we might be approaching uh, the threshold or the the limit line uh, of a kind of schizophrenic society with uh, multiple existence, existences in the real and the virtual world uh, embody what he called the body without organs this concept of the body without organs which was proposed by Gilles Deleuze was invented um, by the playwright Antonie Artaud in a radio broadcast called Pour un fini avec le ju jugement de Dieu to end with the judgment of God in 1947 and uh, so Artaud was a theater director and he wrote a many provocative uh, texts and f and uh, he wrote about the body and the body of the actor especially as a site for representation uh, and also transformation pol political and artistic transformation um, so for Artaud the theater is the place where life is reenacted through the body the body without organs is the name of the body redone and reorganized and once freed through corporeal training from its autom automatisms it's open to dance in reverse so Ar Artaud had this system of uh, actor training um, that wanted to release the body of the actor of, of all um, previous conditioning so to make this body completely open and completely uh, free and the work of the philosopher um, Gilles Deleuze uh, and Fe Felix Guattari which I just mentioned before they pick up this term of the body without organs which is referring initially to the virtual the virtual body a body uh, in potency or a, a, a body of possibilities through which the real body can express itself through a set of gestures, habits, movements, but also virtual or potential dimensions, a vast reservoir of potential gestures, movements and connections. The potential that this collection the, the laws calls body without organs becomes active with the interaction between the various bodies real and virtual in what he calls the plane of imminence so as you can see this idea of of the body body without uh, organs of, of Gilles Deleuze is really very close to what we are experiencing now with this boundary between the real and the virtual really uh, diluted we all now experience different very different facets from ourselves we are all taking care of our our digital selves and our real selves and and they are completely mutually interfering um constantly interfering with the, with each other Of course, Gilles Deleuze, and that's why I mentioned uh, Artaud, Antonin Artaud, before Gilles Deleuze was interested 
in the in the virtual possibilities of the human body but he was also very interested in these virtual possibilities as expressions of action action in the world and this idea of the expression of motion and emotion was already explored uh, in the 50s especially uh, also in painting in the work of uh, Jackson Pollock who had registered his emotions in apparently random choreographies of movements that were executed in large-scale canvas lying on the floor allowing as much freedom of movements as possible and to paint he used non-conventional objects such as hold tin cans suspended by wires or broomsticks as flexible extensions of his body. Pollock stated that this allowed him to move freely around the painting, letting the painting process flow and the painting itself acquire a life of its own. So already from the 50s on, there was this interest in, um, in um, abstract expressionist uh, painting, this interest in showing this virtual aspect of, of the human body, uh, virtual in the sense not that it's on the computer, but in the sense of possibilities, possibilities of, of uh, action. Um, an expressionist painting, which happened often in a very large scale, so it also had this strong atmospheric uh, uh, quality, uh, really explored uh, explored uh, this idea and also the idea of movement. Uh, you remember when we talked a lot, uh, we talked a lot about movement before in the context of the avant-garde and how um, and how this idea of working with the negative space and of recording uh, movement and and so and and this was this was something that was done um, in painting and then it was transported in the 60s and the 70s to performance art. And when this happened, this exploration of the body in movement in the canvas, which is still a flat surface, so there's a representation and it's happening spatially, of course, it's happening in the void of space, but it's represented in canvas um, uh, or in the support where, where the paint uh, registered. But the whole potential of the human body uh, performative potential of the human body in space was really blooming and exploring in the 60s and the 70s uh, so the main focus uh, of also of, the, of this uh, lesson um, and and that's uh, what we're dedicating ourselves to now so just to, uh, to make a reference to you um, to the paintings of Jackson, uh, Jackson Pollock, please take a look at figure 10.12. So the potential of the human body in movement was already vastly explored before in the Bauhaus, of course, and then in the performance arts of the 60s and 70s in order to understand the mechanisms that generate action, especially those that occur in a subconscious or involuntary way. The work developed in this field has produced impressive results and many performances of body art exploited the limit states of the human body in the work of artists such as Gina Payne, Marina Abramovic and Rebecca Horn. So as a reference, uh, an example, please take a look at the work of Rebecca Horn in uh, figure 10.12, where we have a kind of small uh, portable um, architecture also for you as interior designers, it's important to see. This is like a small, a small closet, which is also a feathered enclosure. So she creates this kind of feathered cocoon, which is just adjusted to the lim to the immediate scale of, of the human body. So something uh, that has a lot to do with this topic of haptics, of touch that, that we mentioned before. So trying to bring to really bring into material and into the performance this uh, uh, physical haptic connection to the space. In this case, uh, directly in interaction with the body, with the human body. Also, in the 60s and 70s, the choreographer Merce Cunningham now we are making a connection with the virtual again. The choreographer Merce Cunningham developed 
a process in dance that explored randomness as a means of arriving at a new dance practice, the same that uh, the musician John Cage uh, tried to do with his compositions. Just as Cage found music in the everyday sounds of the environment, Merce Cunningham proposed that walking, standing, leaping and the full range of natural movement possibilities could be considered as dance and each movement was something in itself. Such theories in music and dance had been large influenced, for example, by Zen uh, philosophy and the interest in the human body, as both Cunningham and Cage uh, felt deep sympathy for, uh, for Buddhism, but also yoga. Merce Cunningham was pioneer in realizing the potential of applying motion capture to his choreographies. In the late 90s, he used such technology to register the movement of the human body through the use of sensors placed in strategic points in the dancer's bodies. So please take a look at figures uh, 10.15, 10.16 and 10.18, where we have here. These are the first motion capture images. Now every film, animated film we see or video game, this became completely mainstream. It uses motion capture technology. Uh, so it is possible to have a performer or an actor doing uh, perf performing uh, actions and having his motions captured very very finely not just the motion of the body but nowadays also the motions motions of the face um, and this can be directly uh, interpreted uh, in a virtual environment by by an avatar which is which is anim animated through these uh, motions, but this development came through the work of Merce Can or the choreographer Merce uh, Cunningham. So motion capture allowed for a series of recordings of the movement of the human body that were projected on stage as linear diagrams of the body or a second shadow that interacted with the dancers. This technology has since been further developed for computer animation in the last years and is nowadays used in animation of parametric models for character simulation in digital mu movies, computer games or virtual um, simulations. So we also see here that uh, what I mentioned before, this idea of the body, the body without organs from Gilles Deleuze and we see from these virtual very ephemeral virtual uh, stick figures from the dance of, of um, dance piece of Merce Cunningham that the aesthetic from the 90s onwards the aesthetic was already very focused on this immateriality of, of the digital world uh, and how this immateriality was starting to blend uh, to blend with uh, real life but at the same time many artists were also interested in exploring the material part of, uh, um, of the interaction with the human world. Uh, and another example is uh, from the word, uh, work of Portuguese artist uh, Elena Almeida, um, who explored uh, in, in a series of actions called uh, Experiência do Lugar or the Experience of Place. Uh, and she explored these metaphysical dimensions of the human body, its relation towards space and movement as a continuous flow that is influenced by many parameters such as gravity or uh, aging. So for a few examples of the work of Elena Almeida, please take a look at figures 10.19 and 10.20, where you have some examples of the human body in this case Elena Almeida she started her work as an artist and worked a lot with performance art in the 70s and as she became older um, she started to work more on this topic of the challenges that that an aged uh, human body has uh, but also how in in terms of interaction with space um, and how the and also making this uh, contrast on the fragility of the human body dealing with its own uh, vulnerability um, and and how this is di directly uh, experienced uh, in space so the relationship between the human body and technology 
he has generated an intense debate, especially in philosophy and in the arts, in which the work of uh, another performance artist, Australian performance artist Stellark, he has had a huge importance as one of the most radical and provocative manifestations. The artist Stellark assumes himself as a cyborg and his, work, his body is a canvas or a work in progress. Stellark has successfully implanted an artificially created third ear in his arm where he plans to install a microphone and Bluetooth system to make it here. To Stellark, to the artist Stellark, we have always been prosthetic bodies and obsolete, and it is technology that allows the preservation and evolution of the human body. In other words, Stellak suggests that man is artificial by nature and to extend the body is the human's natural instinct. So of course, this is a very provocative uh, statement and I had the opportunity to meet the artist Stellark live <laughs> once in Portugal and, and to have a conversation. To, to have a, a, a conversation with him because I'm also a performance artist and at the time I was very young and very excited about uh, about meeting one of my one of my performance art uh, heroes um, and he is really nice to talk to for, first of all and his project is really interested so interesting so Stellak has really worked with many uh, uh, research and science uh, groups and uh, he actually started to study architecture he was very interested in architecture space and then became interested in how space and how technology affects the human body and he started to work as an artist after after this um, and so he, he takes his own body as an architecture uh, so he works with the architecture of his own body and and he transformed literally transforms his body to see what happens with his uh, sensorium so uh, in this project of the implanted ear his idea was to have another ear uh, an artificially an artificially created ear uh, which by being implanted directly in his uh, in his body extends his range of experience so this is Stellark's uh, position. Of course, uh, Stellark is uh, he's a cyborg. He defines himself as a cyborg, and he's very interested in this um, idea of how we can use technology as an extension uh, of the human body. And of course, now we make this parallel to architecture because in many or architecture and interior space, um, we we can see and we understand that of course architecture is also a form of technology uh, that extends our uh, uh, the, the possibilities of the human body and that at the same time protects uh, protects the, the human body but also extends our possibilities of action of reaction and of life uh, with more or less sophisticated sophisticated means of course, in this case, Stellark, besides the third year, he has also uh, incorporated in his performances. He's a performance artist. He's incorporated with his performance very complex um, mini mini or para architecture um, architectures. For example, a, th a robotic arm or an exo exoskeleton. Uh, that is uh, designed as a spider and moves as a spider and he was in the center as the center of the spider and controlling the arms and the legs of, of this spider to, through a series of uh, controllers and joysticks and so um, so the, the work of Stelic is really really interesting and it's also very interesting in terms in terms of architecture because um, in this sense uh, Stellark is a little bit like a Leonardo Leonardo da Vinci who, who was also interested in uh, machines and this kind of uh, inventions as forms of architecture in themselves. Uh, so for two uh, images, uh, image references of, of the work of Stellark, please take a look at figures 10.20 and 10.21 and actually if you are curious you can take a look Today, there was an article. I, I will link it uh, for you. There was an article in the in the Guardian, in the British newspaper, the Guardian, about a new exhibition of of Stellark, which is uh, opening now 
in Australia, a re retrospective of his work, and also with new works that use um, telepresence, that, that use uh, virtual reality. Uh, and it will be possible to visit and to interact with the installation and, and remote control, go through remote control, interfere with what's happening in real time, in real time. Um, in the in the exhibition so uh, now there's more constraints because of corona but the exhibition is still is still uh, happening uh, because besides robotics stellar also ex was a really pioneer since since the 90s or the late 80s in exploring how how um, uh, digital technology and uh, virtual reality so he has been very connected to these different worlds and and exploring this Deleuze idea of the body without organs or organs without without bodies and now we come back we come back to architecture so we can see that in the lesson before we spoke about architecture and we spoke about Le Corbusier and the modular and how architecture after ignoring the human body through many decades with the decline of the modular and its limited parametric and simplistic view on, on the human and on, on the male human body as a system of proportions architecture start started to see again the import, the importance of the, the human body of the body as flesh um, also because of this appearance of cyberspace and and of the of the increasing presence of the digital world uh, and the expansion uh, and inter incorporation of virtual reality in our daily daily lives so another author um, Marcus Novak in his uh, seminal work, Transvergence Allogenesis, notes on the production of the alien from 2002, points that the digital era is the era of the production of the allo, and in Greek, it's the alien or the other, in which cyberspace allows the possibility for the expansion of human consciousness and the construction of the self. Novak compares the digital age to the era of the production of man in the Renaissance and his transdisciplinary approach to architecture, science and arts recalls humanist uh, thinking. So Marcus Novak was also interested in this idea of, of uh, cyber, uh, cyberspace and virtual reality and how the incorporation of technology might allow us to understand better how the how the human body and the human mind uh, works. Marcus Novak is also very interested in brain research and cognitive uh, research. Um, and in his uh, lab, he really tries to look for uh, does research and and looks for these possibilities of of mixing uh, virtual reality with uh, architectural space and how through the influence of these both worlds, we can both extend our creative possibilities uh, and at the same time understand better our own uh, humanity. So another rad radical view that really took interest in the human body in the context of architecture uh, was proclaimed by Marcus Cruz uh, in the Riba awarded thesis, The Inhabitable Flesh of Architecture. Uh, Cruz explores architectural space as the field for the expression of the uncanny, an allegorical reference to Freud's concept of das Unheimliche, what is familiar but at the same time strange. So Marcus Cruz, uh, for an image of a performance of uh, Marcus Cruz, Please take a look at figure 10.22. Uh, um, Marcus Cruz, uh, he's uh, Portuguese like me, and I also had the opportunity of meeting him, meeting him once and talking about his work. Um, he was also very influenced by by the by science fiction and by the and by the ideas from uh, Cronenberg of, of, of the flesh. Uh, we talked about existence before and, and this was why I wanted to give you this review in this context from science fiction and how 
Actually, I want to now explain to you that I gave you these references from science fiction exactly because science fic fiction is a really interesting genre always because it reflects about the current developments of technology and projecting how these developments of technology are going to shape our future. So often what happens with science fiction is that uh, man many questions which are addressed in science fiction at some point become real. But it's not because they are just doing random prophecies, it's because science fiction is already written and built based on, on contemporary scientific possibilities. So it's speculating what happens if these possibilities are real, what are the um, ethical considerations, uh, what will be the challenges we will have to deal with if these things actually come true um, and, and all other uh, existen existential questions that, that, need to, that need to be dealt. So in fact in this case science fiction first we started with Stanley Kubrick and, and uh, space travel and then we went now to how in science fiction and the work of Cronenberg this idea of the virtual of the virtual world, the virtual body, the body that can travel without moving uh, through through cyberspace, uh, and the consequences that this that this virtual body would have in our in our uh, real real lives. So Marcus Nov Stellar and all in architecture, Marcus Novak and Marcus Cruz, they both directly addressed address these is issues. And in the case of Markus Novak, he's mostly very focused on technology and on the virtual world. And Markus Cruz was more interested in, in this flesh of architecture. And so he developed many interesting uh, projects at the Bartlett School of Architecture in, in London. Um, and the whole um, idea was to, was to develop these projects that uh, propose how through synthetic uh, materials that can be organic mixed uh, mixed with uh, that that can be synthetic mixed also with organic materials or for example uh, cloned parts or living tissue and so on and how these flashes of architecture can actually be used to be uh, building and at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London there's a lot of research done uh, in this uh, in this field, so Marcus Cruz fleshy architecture is made of synthetic neoplasms, and it's inspired by these game pods I showed you before from Cronenberg's Existence. And um, Marcus Cruz also directly the, the, his work is very provocative, and he war wants to in many ways break taboos in architecture. Uh, he wants to break this modernist Le Corbusier uh, taboos of hygiene and standardization um, and uh, objection and disgust. So he, he really wants to make an opposition, opposition through this. And uh, he wishes that this kind of neoplasmatic architecture can be made of responsive living flesh like a real body and can purge or clean through this pores and orifices uh, the modernist go ghosts of an architecture that he considers obsolete. So after Le Corbusier's failed attempt to definitely fill the gap between the human body and architecture, we see that there was also a lot of criticism we had in the in the 90s and especially in the 2000s there was really this return to the body uh return to the body in these two directions very distinct two directions interest in the virtual body and the virtual possibilities of the body and how they are influencing the real body and also in the real body which is really made of flesh um, and to really address this flesh of architecture. And here we have, for example, with the work of Marcus Cruz and, as I mentioned, Johanny Palazma. Um, in industrial design, and especially in human-machine interfaces or in prospect uh, pros uh, prosthetics, there have been considerable developments also, especially from the 2000s on, that opened the possibilities of a more body-tailored uh, design. 
in which flexibility, responsiveness and in intuit intuition in using are the fundamental concepts developed. This is possible due to the recent developments in mind and brain theory and also to the new digital technologies that allow the translation of all sorts of information to a mathematical or programming language, for example, biomechanical processes such as movement, as we mentioned before. In the field of artificial intelligence, we are also having a lot of influence, uh, and this is directly impacting, nowadays directly impacting the, the way we design and the way we build. There have been uh, many studies that simulate behavior phenomena through this kind of uh, approach. So uh, you probably already heard about algorithms that uh, generate uh, simulations, uh, but also that um, that can be um, that can be used to to predict. Uh, human behavior um, and also to to in many ways to shape uh, human behavior so for example you probably already heard about smart cities and how smart cities are really going to radically transform the way the way we build and the way the way we design um, I will talk a little bit more about, about smart cities uh, later, but uh, it comes in this context uh, that uh, through smart cities uh, methodologies, we are able to really um, synchronize information from many different sources. And, and this can be applied in health and in building and all this information can, can be synchronized since now we all have handies and, and, we, and the computers and so all this information which is constantly collected through, through, the, through the items we used is gathered, uh, it's constantly gathered and it's sorted by more and more intelligent uh, algorithms that, that make profiles of us as users and of our habits and and in many ways this shapes back our behavior because then of course we get a lot of we get a lot of hints and we get a lot of nudges from technology to that give us recommendations of things we can do and things things we can buy so these algorithms uh, really are uh, are not just a science science fiction possibility they they are um, a part of, of daily life. So just a parallel now with the topic, with the topic of uh, smart cities. Um, so also regarding technological developments, and now we are finally arriving to uh, brain, uh, brain theory. Nowadays, it's possible to observe the interior human body without invading it or without harming its uh, integrity uh, through the use of machinery, for example, the MRI, the magnetic resonance uh, images. And because of these systems, because these systems use digital information, this kind of image can be easily processed, for example, in parametric 3D modeling and animation. And for example, Marcus, uh, Marcus Novak's project, The Allo Brain, uh, he has uh, used an MRI scan of his own uh, brain to develop a 4D interactive environment. And in this simulation, it is possible to experience the movement of the syn synaptic flow inside the human brain, allowing the demonstration of its role in the process of uh, cognition. So this, this was uh, one of the projects of, of Marcus uh, Novak uh, from the Allo Brain from 2009. He has uh, he has more recent projects that go that go in this uh, direction. Um, so to take a look at examples of the technology, please take a look at figures 10.24. Uh, so this is a digital section of the human brain, which is an with an MRI and figure 10.25. It's an example of this 4D uh, immersive environment uh, created by Marcos Novak for the for the Allo Brain uh, project. And you can see uh, in figure 10.24 uh, 
how this section of the human brain, which is done through a machine, before you remember in the first les lesson, first and second lesson, when I spoke to you about Leonardo da Vinci um, and the first dissections of the human body, we could only do it with the, with the body of the dead. We could only open and look at the human brain with, with, a, with a dead brain. And then later, of course, there was the possibility of doing vivisection. We talked about it in the context of Descartes. Um, but of course, vivisection of humans, no, we do, we do not do it. Uh, we wouldn't do it now. And now we can do it with, with these uh, machines to see in real time how, how the brain works. And, and there are more, more and more advanced um, technologies which, which allows, allow us to do this in, in real time. Uh, in architectural design, digital modeling and rapid prototyping tools are replacing analogical design systems prog progressively, but there still isn't a single tool that joins the psychophysiological characteristics of dwellers and architectural space together as parameters or rules in the generation or simulation of, of designs which are empathic and corporeal. The performance of the human body in space and behavior is still the ultimate test of the quality of architecture, normally possible only after construction and always working with a great amount of uncertainty. So it would take until the second half of the 20th century for architecture to keep up with phenomenology's interest in experience and the role of the human body as a medium and for the technological developments of the 80s for phenomenology to be rediscovered by science to specifically neuroscience and biology namely through the work of Varela the cognitive scientist Varela and the general establishment of the concept of embodiment in the 90s. Varela, influenced by his mentor Maturana, who had a strong interest in philosophy, allies phenomenology to biology, proposing a neurophenomenology that is based on the study of the subjective first person or first person science, in which subjects observe and study their own perceptions and conscious experience through the use of scientifically accepted methods. Varela is also credited for introducing the concept of autopoiesis to biological theory and introduced the revolutionary concept of the body as both a biological system that is governed personally or through subjective experience. This brought about the revolutionary notion of emotions as biological reactions and is still to this day the most important change in paradigm since uh, Immanuel Kant's proposal. The Portuguese-American neurophenomenologist Damasio would develop Varela's concept of autopoiesis even further by suggesting the role of emotions in the regulation of a body's homeostasis and feelings as somatically constructed images that allow the body to regulate itself. Damasio's notion of image overtakes the usual definition of eye-related perceptions. Instead, Image is a mentally constructed array of perceptions that the body makes as a whole, visual, haptic, oral and kinesthetic, to contribute meaning to certain experiences and situations. Through such images, the mind constructs memories and the body relies on these to construct experience and knowledge of the self and of the world, evolving gradually from proto-self to self and to extended self, in other words, from consciousness to extended consciousness. The Mazi proposes that extended consciousness is responsible for conscience and that this is a condition of higher developed neurological systems and hence exclusively human. The Mazi bases his theory on the crit critique of Descartes' dualism, on the method of phenomenological reduction, on the philosophical writings of Spinoza and also on the practical experiences in the field of biology and medical sciences, which are only possible through the use of the recently discovered technologies of neuroimaging used in neuroanatomy, the ones I just mentioned before. Damasio and his team's experimental work is focused mostly on the application of such technologies 
in the study and treatment of certain brain pathologies responsible for behavior, movement and cognition disorders. In his book, Looking for Spinoza, Joy, Sorrow and the Feeling Brain, the Mazi reports an experiment with a woman who suffered a stroke which inhibited a part of her brain from experiencing emotions such as sadness, anger or pain. Although in a first reading this may seem like an advantage, the fact was that the same, at the same time the patient had difficulties experiencing other strong emotions, namely joy. This was reflected mostly through a very sudden change of attitude towards her closest ones, such as family members and old friends, hence the reasons for her looking for treatment. In this case study, Damasio and his team applied electrodes in very specific points of the patient's body in an effort to understand if the stimulation of these through a very small voltage of electric current would make the nervous system transmit the information to the part of the brain that seemed not to be working properly. The experiment revealed to be a success, as through this the woman, who in the beginning was calm and in a general good mood, started to feel unexplainable feelings of sadness and despair, crying involuntarily and being unable to control these overtaking feelings. Damasio and his team concluded that the problem was in the transmission of neurological information and in the capacity of the patient's brain to interpret it. Now maybe you are a little bit confused why we are talking about an, experience, an experiment in neuroscience, but the reason to be talking to, to, that I mentioned this to you has to do with how amazing it is, how fascinating it is that now through neuroscience, we can understand so much about how the human body feels and how, how what parameters interfere with our uh, experience of emotion. And now we can use this knowledge and these tools to understand better how our built environment impacts our human body, our well, our well being, but also how it allows us to express the full range of our um, of, of our capacity for for experience and for emotion, the full spectrum of emotion of the human being. So we could adopt and transport these ideas from, for example, the Masius experiments um, to understand better a design, a design project. And this is actually what is already being done in the field, in the field of neuroscience and architecture. And that will be uh, the topic to which our next lesson will be dedicated to. Uh, I hope I hope you got very curious. You got a lot of input today from all these theories. So we talked about space travel and we talked about science fiction and how science fiction made these predictions about the new world, about how technology was going to shape the new world. Uh, then we arrived at these, um, uh, these uh, very different provocative positions that address the human body through performance art and also through uh, and, and performance art in architecture, directly addressing the human body, human body and virtuality and human body and the material, the material body and the flesh of architecture. And now we arrive at neurosciences and how neurosciences by using digital technology actually are allowing us to understand how our own flesh uh, works. So we are we are living this very exciting time that uh, through technology we can understand our organic selves uh, much better and uh, and the possibilities that this can bring for architecture and 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 the consequences that the consequences that this is having in architecture history. This this is shaping obviously architecture history now more recently most recent history of architecture um, and how it's going to shape architecture history in the future in the present and most of all how it's going to shape the way the way we design and the way we live and 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 how it's directly shaping 
our human bodies uh, themselves. So it's also how it's directly transforming ourselves. So until the next lesson, thank you very much.